There's more mischief, mayhem, and nefarious goings-on in the city of brotherly love than Billy Penn could have ever imagined. We've got it all here on the Twisted Billy Podcast. True crime, haunted history, the coolest and creepiest places to visit. Welcome Welcome to to Twisted Twisted Billy. Billy. Hey, Twisters, what up? Welcome back to Twisted Philly. As I worked on this episode, I was in Cape May, New Jersey. Yes, that's part of the month-long Festivus of my kid. So if you're not from the area and you've never heard of Cape May, go look at a map. Now look at the very bottom of New Jersey and that tiny little tip that sticks out, that's Cape May. It's called Exit Zero because the exit number off the highway is actually zero. I don't have too many Jersey listeners. Twisted Philly actually has more listeners in the UK than I do in Jersey. So maybe the Jersey peeps could start stepping up and showing me some love. Thanks for listening to episode nine, Get a Grip. I really enjoyed recording that episode, and I love changing it up from true crime. If you can't tell, I'm a history nerd, and it definitely comes out in this podcast. When I do this show, it's pretty off the cuff. I mean, I have a ton of research notes that I reference while I'm talking to all of you. But for the most part, this is like me sitting down with one of my girlfriends or one of my guy friends and just shooting the shit. The story I'm talking about today is a local story, and it's local because the crime occurred about 20 minutes up the road from where I live, and the murderer lived in Upper Marion, which is where I live now. This is not my hometown. I moved here a few months before my daughter was born in 2000. Upper Marion is certainly my daughter's hometown because it's the only place that she's ever lived. And even though I didn't grow up here, I spent plenty Saturday nights hanging out at one of the largest malls in the country. But I knew the Upper Marion area long before I moved here. What I didn't realize when I moved here, though, is how many twisted true crime stories are tied to this community in one way or another. I think it's because so much of the community was built on remediated EPA sites. And I know this because when I was house hunting in 2000, I almost bought a property that was on a remediated EPA site. I spent days on the phone with the EPA going through all of the chemicals in the runoff water near that property. The worst was benzene, which was especially dangerous to pregnant women, which I was at the time, and nursing mothers, which I would have soon been. The gentleman I spoke to was also kind enough to help me navigate their website so I could check out all the properties I was exploring, and lucky me, I eventually found one that wasn't sitting on a giant mound of poisoned dirt. Upper Marion is also full of sinkholes. That big mall I mentioned, yeah, well a few years ago we had an enormous sinkhole open up right in front of the mall. It was big enough to swallow a car. I swear one day that mall is going to get sucked into the ground like the Hellmouth in Buffy the Vampire Slayer, so please, Spike, please come help me fight the retail Hellmouth. Today's story is something I've been researching off and on for a few months. Living in the hometown of the murderer, I figured I had to know people who grew up here and went to school with this person or remembered him from the community. I wanted to know where did he live, what were his interests in school, was there anything about him as a kid or a teenager that might have given, I don't know, any indication to the crimes that he would commit in the 90s. And I didn't want to tell his story until I had some local flavor beyond my own local flavor of living in the same town where this particular murderer grew up. And who is this particular murderer? Well, his name is Caleb Fairley, or K-Blob as he was called because he was bullied in middle school and high school. Yeah, that local color that I was hunting for, I found it. I found things I was never even expecting. Caleb Fairley lived in Upper Marion, Pennsylvania, and that's a suburb to the north and west of Philadelphia. It's a nice town. I've been living here for 16 years, and I've been kind of stuck here because of my desire to keep my kid in the same school district until she graduates. And we're lucky because we have good schools. Well, the elementary schools are fantastic, and the middle school is amazing. They've won many National School of Character awards, if not every year, almost every other year, like Obama visited the middle school. What the hell happened in high school? I can't even answer that. My kid had issues with bullying last year. They were so bad, I had to get the Upper Marion police involved, who were great, by the way. They shut that shit down. But the high school looks like a prison, and plenty of kids, including my own, say that it feels like a prison on the inside, too. I don't know what it is, but some kids just completely lose their shit when they get into high school. In the case of Caleb Fairley, though, he seemed to lose his shit a few years after he graduated. 
So I made some social media posts asking if anyone in the community knew Caleb when they were in high school or if they knew of him or maybe they knew someone who knew someone who knew him. And I had comments from people not wanting me to tell the story. It's a painful story and you'll understand why as I get into it. But I got the sense that some people didn't want me to tell this story not just because it's painful for the victims and their families but because it paints the community of Upper Marion in a negative light. Like, this is Society Hill, or some other even more upscale and more affluent community than it really is. It's a nice area. Nice houses, decent schools, again, except for the high school. But this isn't paradise here. We're surrounded by gas stations and mini marts and fast food joints, the second largest mall in the country. So big box retail is really what wins out here, not so much small independent businesses. And there's so many chain restaurants that I could throw up if we open one more. Lucky for me, I live in a more western part of the city that backs up to Valley Forge Park. But Upper Marion is no better than so many other communities. And I definitely felt like an outsider um, when I've been around people who grew up here. It's like they look at you and they say, oh, you're not from here. And I'm like, no, but who the fuck cares? Some of the people who are from around here have killed other people. Okay, so let's talk about Caleb. Caleb grew up in Upper Marion, closer to a town called Conshohocken, but certainly within the Upper Marion School District. And he was the oldest child in a seemingly typical upper middle class suburban family. His dad was a pharmacist. Oh, and wait till you hear that story, but that comes much later. And his mom helped run the pharmacy. She also maintained this little children's clothing boutique space within the pharmacy. So she had like her own little business within their family business. There's not much information about Caleb's life before he hit the news other than one of his younger siblings who died in 1989, two years before Caleb graduated high school. Caleb's brother was six when he died, and it was the result of an accidental self-inflicted gunshot wound from a gun that his father kept in the home for protection. Caleb is someone who was described as a weird kid. Most of the research I did used a variety of words to paint a picture of an odd loner or an overweight weirdo. When I started talking with people who knew him or knew of him, the few people that were willing to talk to me, they had very similar stories to tell, and then they also had worse stories to tell. So some of the people that I talked to either went to middle school with Caleb or they went to high school with him or both, and they used a lot of the same words that the news used. They used the words odd and weird. They used strange. Someone used the phrase, there was something off about him. So of course, I asked all of them, well, in what way? They said Caleb didn't have many friends. He didn't seem like he wanted to make friends. He seemed to keep to himself because there really wasn't any other company to keep. So they didn't necessarily describe him as a loner. Their descriptions were more like someone who was alone simply because there were no other options. Caleb was a new student in middle school, but whether he was new because he moved to Upper Marion, which is possible since the home associated with the family was bought in 1986, or he was just newer because he went to a different elementary school. And like so many communities, when you leave elementary school and you head to middle school, there's tons of new kids all converging in one new school. So these kids aren't really new. They're just new to you. The people that I spoke to, at least, hadn't known Caleb before middle school, so he seemed very new to them. He was a little overweight. Somebody I talked to described him as doughy or soft. And as you can imagine, all of these descriptors led to bullying. He was picked on by people. Kids made fun of him. They called him K-Blob instead of Caleb. And it didn't seem like anyone wanted much to do with him. And then I heard a story that I really wasn't expecting. In eighth grade, the bullying took a nasty turn. And this would have been at Upper Marion Middle School. There was a boy, a fellow middle schooler, maybe not the most popular guy, but popular enough. He was someone that everybody knew, and I'm not going to use his name, even though it was shared with me. Well, one day this guy goes into the boys' room, and he comes out telling everyone that he saw Caleb in there masturbating. Yeah, so you're 13 or 14 years old, and if it's true, and someone actually saw you jerking off in the middle school bathroom, that's horrific. And then that someone runs and tells anyone who will listen. And if it's not true and someone spreads this shit about you, what do you do? You're already being teased and bullied and called names, and you try to avoid all of that by keeping to yourself, and then this guy tells everyone that you were wanking it in a bathroom stall. The people that I spoke to who told me about this rumor said that it stuck throughout middle school and high school. So how do you move past something like that? How do you get people to forget it or convince them it isn't true or play it off that it's a rumor even if it was true? 
no one in Upper Marion really knew if it was true or not, but that doesn't matter because once it was out there, it stuck, and it stuck even beyond high school. By the time he got to high school, Caleb seemed to solicit the bullying. I was told by people who were fellow students of his that he was obnoxious and annoying and that there was a sense of anger about him. And this would have been soon after his little brother died. So maybe that's the reason for the anger he demonstrated. One person in particular told me it seemed like he was seeking attention, even if the attention was horrible in the form of people making fun of him. It didn't matter. At least he was getting a reaction out of someone. Caleb was smart. That's something else I was told by some of his classmates. He was a weird kid. He gave people the creeps, but he was smart. And you wouldn't necessarily think he was smart because of the way he behaved. One neighbor, and this isn't someone I spoke to, but someone who was interviewed in 1995 by a local newspaper, talked about Caleb being in the same gifted classes as her daughter. But people also said he didn't seem to have any drive or desire to do anything with his smarts. He graduated from Upper Marion High School in 1991. I went to our township library to look at his yearbook and it wasn't there. Now, yearbooks in the library go back to the 50s and I didn't see any other yearbook missing from the collection. So I asked the information desk where it was and I was simply told if it's not there then we don't have it. So I looked at Caleb's underclassmen yearbooks. I mean, are you going to ditch four years of yearbooks because this kid turned out to be a murderer? I guess not because they were all there. His pictures looked like a normal kid. Yeah, I mean, maybe he was a little heavy. But no heavier than a lot of teenage guys I went to high school with who were still carrying around some baby fat. He didn't look like he dressed weird. He looked well-groomed. So from appearance only, whatever his classmates were making fun of didn't seem to be anything on the outside, at least not in my opinion. But kids suck. Not all kids, but some kids. You know, I see it with my daughter. I see it with some of her friends, the things that they go through, the things that each of us went through, even when we had wonderful friends. Middle school, junior high, high school, for some kids, it's just about survival. And I think that's what Caleb's experience must have been like. He was just trying to survive. In the 90s, Caleb worked at the Old Friendly's restaurant in the King of Prussia Mall. So if you ate there at that period of time, he could have served you your ice cream sundae. And that rumor about him jerking off in the bathroom, well, that seemed to follow him all the way into Friendly's. Coworkers would burst into the bathroom asking him, what are you doing, Caleb? No one ever said he was caught with his pants down, but even after school, he could not live down that hateful middle school rumor. In 1992, Caleb was arrested for harassment and assault. He was driving by a female jogger. He made some nasty sexual comments to her. He tried to proposition her, and as she moved past him, he grabbed her ass. After he graduated, Caleb tried college. He attended Westchester University for a while. He left Westchester and went to Montgomery County Community College, and he left there too. He left there in the spring of 95, and he didn't sign up again for the fall semester. He was out of money. By the end of summer in 1995, Caleb was out of work, he was out of school, and not doing much of anything other than playing fantasy role-play games and reading porn. He had no money, and even though he lived at home with his parents, he had accumulated a decent amount of credit card debt. Around that same time, his mom had just opened a children's clothing store called Your Kids and Mine. And this was an extension of that little children's clothing boutique that she ran out of the family's pharmacy. Since that little space was doing so well, she decided to grow the business with a standalone kids' clothing store. Caleb's mom, Ruth, offered her son a job. She needed someone to help manage the store, and Caleb needed money. So she made a deal with him that if he worked at the store, she would put away money to help pay off his credit card bills. The kid that everyone described as weird and odd and off-putting and strange, someone that gave others the creeps, is put to work in a kid's clothing store. But, you know, his parents don't see him that way. I'm sure they saw that he didn't have many friends and that he spent a lot of time alone, and maybe they were a little concerned about his fascination with the macabre, but he was still their son, so there probably wasn't anything jumping out at them, like a giant flashing neon sign that their kids should not work in the family's new children's clothing store. Just three weeks after the store opened, everyone realized there was no way in hell Caleb ever should have been allowed to work there. Lisa Mandarak was 29 years old on September 10, 1995. She was just a few weeks shy of her 30th birthday. She and her husband James lived in Limerick, Pennsylvania. When I look at wedding photos of Lisa and James, they're just such a beautiful couple and they're so reminiscent of the 80s. Lisa has got big hair and a big dress and a big poofy veil. People look at styles like this today and laugh, but when I look at it, I think, girl, you were rocking it. Like you were on your fashion game. 
they were a gorgeous couple. They both had striking dark hair and beautiful skin, and they had a gorgeous little girl named Devin. In September of 1995, Devin was just a few months shy of her second birthday. On the afternoon of Sunday, September 10th, Lisa and Devin headed to the Collegeville Shopping Center, which was just a few miles from their home in Limerick. Lisa told James she wanted to check out that new children's clothing store that just opened, and she wouldn't be gone long. In fact, she left the diaper bag at home with James and told him she didn't think she would need it. I certainly remember outings like that. I would throw a diaper in my purse because I probably wouldn't even be gone an hour. So you've got a bottle in your hand, your kid is on your hip, you got a bag of Cheerios or goldfish in your purse, and you're ready to run out the door. In this case, Devin had pretzel rods and a cookie from her dad for the short car ride to Collegeville. And the store Lisa wanted to check out was Your Kids and Mine, Ruth Fairley's store, the store where her son Caleb had just started working. Lisa and Devin never came home. That afternoon, James was home watching football and watching the clock. When their families talk about Lisa and James, they talk about a love story, a beautiful relationship, and one where they stayed in frequent contact with each other. Lisa and Devin had left the house a little after 3 p.m. that afternoon, and when they didn't return within a few hours, James grew concerned. He called family members who also tried calling Lisa, but no one could reach her, and shortly after that, James called the Collegeville Police and reported his wife and daughter missing. James told the police he knew where Lisa was going, to your kids and mine in the Collegeville Shopping Center. Police searched the shopping center, and sure enough, they found Lisa's car in the parking lot. Her purse and her phone were in it, but Lisa and Devin were nowhere to be found. James' family was hoping that Lisa was still somewhere in the shopping center. There was a big grocery store, so his family thought maybe Lisa decided to do a little grocery shopping before heading home. They searched the Acme. They even had the store page Lisa, but she wasn't there. While this search is going on in Collegeville, just about 20 minutes down the road, that same afternoon, the Upper Marion Police received a horrible phone call. Two hikers walking along a trail in Valley Forge Park found the body of a toddler. Valley Forge Park is a place where people come to learn about history of the Revolutionary War. They come for picnics. They come to walk the five-mile track. And the park has some pretty large roads running through it. Some of the roads are bigger, and some of them are more hidden access roads and that's where this little girl was found, at the bottom of a hill about 50 yards away from a park access road. It looked like she may have been tossed from a car and rolled down the hill. When Lisa and Devin weren't located at the Collegeville Shopping Center, other police departments were alerted, and Upper Marion reached out to Collegeville about the little girl found in Valley Forge Park. This was only hours after Lisa and Devin left their house to go clothes shopping. Like, they left their house, I don't know, maybe 3.15? And it was between 5 or 5.30 when hikers called police because they found the body of that little girl in the park. It couldn't have been Devin. There just wasn't enough time for something like that to happen. But sadly and crazily enough, it was Devin. James' brother actually made the identification because he couldn't, and I remember hearing stories about the police in Collegeville and Upper Marion at first finding that suspicious, like he couldn't look at the body of his child maybe because he had something to do with it. He didn't. He had absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with his daughter's death, but police, of course, are trained to think that way. Plus, most cases of death in young children involve parents in some way, even if it's accidental, like someone who loses their cool and something horrible happens. And I spent some time thinking about that. Like, if something happened to my kid, that's a parent's worst nightmare, right? You can't reach your kid for 30 seconds. Shit, you can't reach them for 10 seconds, and your mind goes to the worst possible scenarios within a split second, or at least mine does. I can't say what I would do if I had to ID a body. I don't think that I would be able to do it. I think I would make my ex-husband do it, and then once the ID was done, I would go in. But that moment of, of not knowing and praying it's not your child or your wife or your family or your friend, that second before you have to look at the face and say yes or no, I don't think I could do it. I wouldn't want to do it. And I don't think there's anything strange about James not being able to do that. And God bless his brother for doing it for him. Devin's cause of death was manual strangulation someone put their hands around her tiny throat and strangled her. 
Strangulation is not an easy way to die. Anyone, a child, an adult, is going to fight the loss of air. They're going to struggle and thrash under your hands. There was so much pressure on this beautiful baby girl that her collarbone was broken. And I have a really hard time listening to true crime episodes about bad things happening to children. Or I listen and then I fast forward and I skip parts. Shit like that wipes me out. And you guys know that I leave out gruesome details when I'm talking about true crime. So I'm not going to get any more gruesome than that. But I simply cannot comprehend what could go through someone's mind to do that to a little girl. Devin was found, but Lisa was still missing. The clothing store they visited was closed when police arrived Sunday afternoon. The next morning on Monday, September 11th, the police returned to the Collegeville Shopping Center and they interviewed employees of neighboring stores, asking questions about suspicious activity the day before. Did anyone notice anything in the shopping center, especially at your kids and mine? A few people said they saw someone vacuuming the store for a while after it closed the day before, and then again that morning on Monday. And local news crews who were on the site covering the story of Lisa and Devin's disappearance also confirmed that they saw someone vacuuming the store very early that morning while it was closed. And there was a witness, a shopper who placed Lisa and Devin in your kids and mine around 3.40 p.m. on Sunday, September 10th. She was checking out as they walked in, and eventually police were able to grab a timestamp from her receipt. Lisa and Devin were alive when they entered the store at 3.39. They were alive and alone with Caleb Fairley. On Monday, police contacted the store owner, Ruth Fairley, to ask who had been working on Sunday, and she told him it was her son, Caleb. So of course the police wanted to talk to him. Caleb wasn't home, and Ruth had a buying trip that day, so she left a note for her son, letting him know Collegeville police wanted to talk to him about the disappearance of a mother and daughter who were seen in the shopping center. Caleb rolls in the next morning. He'd been out all night at a concert at an after-hours club in Philly called Asylum. Here's the thing about asylum. I used to go there. I wasn't still going there in 95 when Caleb was. It was probably more like, I don't know, 92, 93. Asylum was crazy. The place looked like the inside of a padded cell, and I thought that was cool. I used to go to a place called The Bank, which was this awesome alternative club that was in what was an old historic bank. The bank played techno and alternative music, and the songs would run one into another, and it seemed like it never stopped. The bank was really cool until, I don't know, early to mid-90s. Frat guys in khakis and polos started to show up, and then it was lame. Sorry, frat guys, but it just was. Sometimes when you left, though, you didn't want to stop dancing. So there were two places you could go. You could go to Revival or you could go to Asylum. At Asylum, the music was harder, the clientele seemed a little rougher, but it was another place you could dance till 4 a.m., and it was kind of cool because it was really weird and different and strange. So when I read Kalem was at Asylum the night that Lisa and Devin disappeared, the night that Devin was found just a few hours earlier tossed in the woods in Valley Forge Park, it freaked me out. It freaked me out that I occasionally hung out at the same club as him, even if it was a few years earlier. When Caleb got home, he called the police and he spoke to Sergeant Bruce Pinnell. He tells the sergeant that he closed his mom's shop, your kids and mine, at 5.30 on Sunday. The sergeant asks him if he saw anyone matching Lisa's description in the store, and he says he doesn't really remember. He was out at a club and saw lots of women last night who could match that description. But Sergeant Pinnell wasn't asking him if he saw Lisa Mandarak at an after-hours club. He was asking Caleb if he saw her in broad daylight in his store. Caleb then volunteers that his face is covered with scratches because he fell when he left asylum and he face planted on the curb. And Caleb, just why would you share something like that with police? Like no one asked you if your face was covered with scratches. A little later that morning around 10 a.m., two police detectives meet Caleb Fairley at Your Kids and Mine in the Collegeville Shopping Center and they ask him to come to the police station to answer some questions. Caleb agrees, and they take him to Upper Marion Police Station because Caleb is from Upper Marion, and that's the department that's handling little 19-month-old Devin's murder. Caleb gives the officers directions to follow the quickest route from Collegeville to Upper Marion, and he takes them through back roads leading into Valley Forge Park. At some point, they were probably driving along the very access road where someone drove the day before to dispose of Devin's body. When they get to the station, they notice his face is covered with makeup. 
Caleb tries to brush it off like it was makeup he wore the night before when he was out at a concert, so the police ask him to wash his face. And his face is jacked up. It doesn't look like anything that happens when you're drunk and faceplant leaving a club. His face is torn up like a wild fucking animal tried to shred him. And there are scratches on his wrists and his hands too, not just all over his face and his forehead. Unlike his conversation with Collegeville police, Caleb tells Upper Marion detectives he closed the store on Sunday at 5, not at 5.30. He went home to get changed and then went to a concert at Asylum with his friend Chris Leffler. He tells Upper Marion police the scratches are from injuries he sustained in a mosh pit at the club, not from face planting on a curb like he told Collegeville police. So Upper Marion police interview Caleb's friend Chris to find out about his whereabouts the night before, and Chris says, yeah, we were at asylum, but Caleb didn't get scratched up at the club. Chris says Caleb told him the injuries were the result of breaking up a fight at his mom's store. Really, a fist fight at a children's clothing store in the middle of suburbia on the afternoon on a Sunday. Chris went on to say that Caleb told him not to tell his parents about the fight at the store, and if they asked, to say he got the scratches in the mosh pit. Detective Seville in Upper Marion gets a search warrant for Caleb's home. And Collegeville police have one for your kids and mine. In Caleb's room, the police find lots and lots of porn. And they find vampire fantasy games and other role-play games. And I'm not even going to get into the horrible assumptions people make about kids who play Dungeons and Dragons. What sucks is there are lots of people who like to play role-play games. There are lots of people who like vampires. Hell, like me, I own every Anne Rice book. I've read all of them at least a dozen times in the last 20 years. But none of these things mean someone is going to go out and kill people. If it does, then the characters in the entire cast of The Big Bang Theory would be considered murderers with all the role-play games they've got going on. But in Caleb's case, it was all considered dark and twisted and nefarious, and it must have led him to do evil things. One of the items they find in Caleb's room is a shirt with an image of a woman being ravaged by a vampire. And the weird thing is that the woman in the design looks a hell of a lot like Lisa Mandrak. Like, a lot, a lot. And I know a lot isn't a word, but talking about a little baby being tossed from a car and thrown down an embankment like she is a bundle of trash has fried my brain cells. And I cannot seem to access the deep recesses of my usually impressive vocabulary. So that, my friends, is my sign to stop. Yeah, I'm taking a break. I knew going into it this would be a two-parter. There's so much more to tell about this story. Where's Lisa? What happened to her and Devin? Did Caleb do it? Was he found guilty? What about Lisa's husband and her family? I'm going to tell you all of that in part two. I hate two-part episodes. Okay, um, actually, that's not fair. I love them and I hate them. I love them because it means there's so much more to come, but I hate them because it's like, how fucking long do I have to wait for part two? Well, you won't have to wait very long because by the time this episode is up in the podcast stratosphere, part two should be up as well. I'm going to try to drop both episodes at once. I just can't produce them at once because this story is just, it's so fucking twisted. And it pisses me off so much that a young mother and her little girl went shopping on an early fall afternoon and never came home. And it scares the shit out of me because I think of all the times that I did that with my kid. We would go to little boutique stores in strip malls and in shopping centers and in places like Media and Chestnut Hill so I didn't have to deal with traffic and throngs of people at a mall. We'd be out supporting independent businesses and it's so easy for your life to get snatched away from you because some twisted asshole can't keep his shit together. I'm not saying ciao for now because Lisa and Devin's story isn't done. So go find part two and press play.